we begin with that plan, that new plan, to automatically charge kids as juveniles. Fox 45's Mackenzie Frost takes us through some of the pushback. Right now, kids can start in the adult criminal justice system depending on the crime, but that would change if a plan that's been backed by Senator Jill Carter in previous years becomes law. And critics argue the juvenile system is less than transparent and is already stressed with the number of kids it's handling. The juvenile justice system filled with layers of protection, keeping information about a young offender's past out of the public's view. In Annapolis, a bill backed by Senator Jill Carter, a Democrat from Baltimore City, would automatically start anyone under 18 in the juvenile system, regardless of the crime. We don't believe they understand, fully understand the consequences of their actions. In a bill hearing in February, Carter argues kids' brains aren't fully developed and a prosecutor can ask for the case to be moved to the adult system if necessary. Right now, the opposite is true. A case can be moved to the juvenile system after starting in the adult court system. System. The burden should not be placed on children to convince a court, I'm a child. That is a ridiculous and unfair burden. Is nothing but a one size fits all that isn't going to help the community. Community activist Europe C. Morgan argues once a kid goes into the juvenile system, information goes dark. And having a blanket law starting a young person in a system already under scrutiny won't help. And the lack of transparency makes it even harder to make it work. They're charging a firearm, 815 heard in court, people shooting and fighting at the location, and I'm Ms. Carla. There's been examples of someone with a juvenile record only coming to light after facing charges again as an adult. Tristan Jackson, arrested in connection for the Brooklyn Homes mass shooting. Fox 45 News uncovering court documents showing Jackson was arrested in February of this year when he was 17 for bringing a loaded handgun to Mervo High School. That information previously shielded from the public because of his age. People are very frustrated with the idea that government doesn't seem to understand what people are dealing with. And on the ground, and prosecutors argue they should have the discretion. Let's start in the right locality. Calvert County State's Attorney Robert Harvey Jr. argues if the crime is serious enough, the suspect should start in adult court. How do you tell a victim, victim's family, uh, that you, you can't charge someone as an adult because of their age when they've committed such a horrible act. Year after year, Carter has unsuccessfully tried to get the plan through the General Assembly. It was also introduced in the House in 2021, each time dying in committee. House Speaker Adrian Jones tells Fox 45 News the juvenile justice system already stressed and struggling to provide adequate services for young offenders. Adding, quote, Maryland's juvenile system is not set up to rehabilitate those who have committed crimes like rape, murder, or armed carjacking. New polling from Gonzalez Research showing almost 60% of Marylanders support tougher on crime plans for young people. And among Democratic voters, 62% of black Democrats support holding young people accountable for their crimes. If Carter introduces the plan again to automatically charge anyone under 18 in the juvenile system, it's unclear if there will be support in January when lawmakers return to Annapolis. Without support from House Speaker Jones, any similar plan introduced again this next year would likely have the same unsuccessful results. In Baltimore, Mackenzie Frost, Fox 45 News. Fox 45 News has heard from more than a dozen states' attorneys across Maryland who represent roughly 5.4 million people. That's about 87% of the state's population. Those prosecutors say their hands are tied. Two laws are at issue here. The Juvenile Justice Reform Act limits children 13 and under from facing most charges. And the Child Interrogation Act prevents police from questioning juvenile suspects without an attorney and parent permission. And they know that, you know, nothing's really going to happen to them if they keep their crime in a certain limit of types of crime. They come in, we can't detain them, they're back in the community the next day. We all have the same sad song, no matter where we are in the state. Well, prosecutors aren't the only ones saying their jobs are impacted. We're also hearing from police who say the recent juvenile justice laws are changing the way they carry out investigations. Juveniles have certain rights um, that are different than adults. We have to make sure their parents are there. The way it's changed is that there's just more things we have to complete before we can even start our investigation. Well, House Speaker Adrian Jones and Senate President Bill Ferguson are two of the most powerful lawmakers in Annapolis. If you'd like to contact them about public safety legislation, their phone numbers and email addresses are on your screen. You can call Jones at 410-841-3800 
or get in touch with Senate President Ferguson at 410-841-3600. Baltimore County is considering adding more elected leaders to the county council, which only has seven members for more than 800,000 residents. Baltimore County is Maryland's third largest county, behind only Montgomery and Prince George's counties. Both of those councils have 11 members. County Executive Johnny Olszewski took to Twitter saying the council hasn't been expanded since 1956, and it is time for a more equitable government. But not all council members agree. What will it cost? What will be the benefits? What will be the detractions? What will be the downside? And I would urge the citizens who have an interest to make sure the county council knows your point of view. Well, Councilman Julian Jones says he likes the council at its current size, but he would be open to expanding to nine council members. We are almost three days into the fighting between Israel and Hamas, so far claiming more than 1,100 lives, including at least 11 Americans. The most devastating incidents, a music festival attack killing 260 people in Israel and an apartment building bombing killing at least 200 along the Gaza Strip. Israelis say they are used to being targeted, but these attacks are unlike any they have ever seen. There is not a single person on the streets. Um, there's no cars. People are scared to go outside. Life has completely stopped. This comes as a top Pentagon official is urging Congress to pass more funding for Israel. But there's no House Speaker at the moment, so Congress can't approve the funding. There are talks that any aid to Israel will be tied to aid to Ukraine. One possible complication, a group of hard-right Republicans refusing to approve any Ukraine aid. Well, tonight, one Jewish community in northeast Baltimore gathered at their synagogue for a prayer vigil for the people of Israel. The community says unity is important during uncertain times, not just for Jewish communities, but for everyone. This is sort of a watershed moment in our history, how important it is that we just act as good people, act with grace, kindness, compassion, and ask God for that compassion reciprocally, you know, to, to, as I said, to Jews and to all of mankind. Everyone was just brought together, like people who... Some people I knew, some people I didn't know, some people who you could tell were more religious, some people who are less religious. Just everybody came together and everybody sang and prayed and everyone really cares for Israel. The Jewish people are really a community. It's not, you don't have people living in, in Israel and people living in America and people living in any other place in the world. The, we, we are one. Well, tonight, Governor Wes Moore shared this photo on Twitter. The government house lit up in blue with a message, we stand in solidarity as we pray for peace and healing. One member of the Jewish community in Baltimore says he's so passionate about Israel, he plans on moving there even after these recent developments. Fox 45's Rebecca Pryor has his story. The impacts of unprecedented attacks on war-torn Israel widespread as the world watches in horror. It's been very traumatic, not just for people that are living in Israel, but for us in the Jewish community with family and friends there. For Eric Rubin, a member of the Baltimore Zionist District. I, I was sick to my stomach. I was, I, was physically, I was physically ill, a lot of tears. A strong connection to his faith has led him to take several trips to Israel. It is our ancestral homeland. Some even taken with professional and college athletes in partnership with the National Athletes for Israel nonprofit. We take them to see the reality on the ground. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, people see too much of Israel of what's going on the news today. Um, but Israel is one of the most beautiful, diverse countries in the world. And while religion is what drew him in, he says it's that beauty and culture that swayed him to stay. It's always been a desire for me to, to go live there. In just three weeks, Ruben and his wife will be relocating to Tel Aviv, a move Ruben still plans to make, despite the tragedies and impacts the overwhelming violence is having on his loved ones. Uh, one of my friends, Ayal Dror, after 24 years, had finally retired from the IDF. He had to leave his wife and three kids to go be stationed at the border um, with Lebanon, which is now seeing uh, rocket attacks. Rocket attacks that are also raining down on the location of his new home right now. I am not going to let terrorists dictate where I live, how I live, the freedoms I have, 
And the minute that either Americans or Israelis or anyone that appreciates a free society starts caving to terrorists, then they win. From Mayor Scott to Governor Westmore, Maryland leaders taking to social media, offering condolences and condemning the violence. And over the weekend, the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore spearheading an emergency fund to help with humanitarian needs, including food, medicine and shelter. Associated President Mark Terrell writing in part, I apologize for breaking the sanctity of Shabbat and the Jewish holidays, but the horrific news of the attack on Israel and its people warrants that I do so. Our collective response at this critical time will save lives. And according to Ruben, My friends in Israel, they see your social media messages. In addition to donations, he's asking those wanting to show support, keep posting prayers for peace. When they know that they have the love and support from family and friends all around the world, and perhaps more importantly, when they have the love and support of strangers, it means a great deal. Rebecca Pryor, Fox 45 News. Anyone who wants to donate to that emergency fund can find a link in our web article on this story on foxbaltimore.com.